OK, I guess let's get started. We're going to talk about depend, uh, control dependence handling today. This has been a fascinating topic for many, many people over the years. Uh, and it's still a very hard problem. How do, you, how do you predict what's coming next? What instruction to execute next? And we'll see why it's important. And you've already seen why it's important, I think, when we talked about pipelining. But it's, it's actually more important than uh, you might imagine as you increase the depth of the pipeline and width of the pipeline, because the amount of wasted work increases quad quadratically once you do that, if you, if you don't fetch the right thing into the pipeline. OK, you know that the homework is due Monday, and the lab assignment due, is due next Friday. And you all started and finished. Not finished, maybe, but started, hopefully. That's good. This will take time, because it's the first Verilog assignment. OK, these are readings for the next few lectures. I've already discussed these two. But I'm also going to uh, recommend a reading for you about combining branch predictors. We're going to talk about branch prediction a lot uh, this today and probably next, uh, next time we meet also. It's a, it's a good introductory. Uh, level reading on branch prediction and how it works. And we'll get to it. Also, at some point, this is also recommended reading. I would recommend you to read the Alpha 21 264 microprocessor, which puts a lot of the concepts that we're going to discuss in the next five or six lectures together. Basically, Alpha 21 264 was Digital Equipment Corporation's flag flagship processor at its time in the late 1990s. It was the fastest processor of its time. And it incorporated a lot of the concepts that we're going to cover. Certainly pipelining, but branch prediction, sophisticated branch prediction, actually, we will see at the end of today or sometime in the next lecture what kind of branch predictor it incorporated. Uh, out of order execution, uh, load store prediction, predicting which stores are actually, which loads are actually dependent on which loads. So it was a very sophisticated processor. And this uh, paper ties in all of those and describes how, a, how such an engine operates. So it's a beautiful paper. You may not be able to understand it right now, but there's a reason why I recommend it right now. Because the person who wrote the paper is actually going to give a lecture. Uh, it's the IEEE Tech Talk in a Calcium seminar that's going to happen. Is this correct? That doesn't look right. That should be Tuesday, right? Yeah, I got the date right, and that should be corrected. And we'll send an email about it, too. It should be Tuesday, February 12th. You probably got an email about this, right? Uh, 4.30 to 6.30 PM at 11.07. Uh, he doesn't work at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation anymore because that corporation doesn't exist. But it was the biggest, it was the biggest uh, microprocessor manufacturer at its time, uh, even bigger than Intel. Uh, the VAX architecture that we discussed, that was Digital Equipment Corporation. Before that, a PDP architecture was Digital Equipment Corporations, and Alpha after that. And Alpha after that, uh, they went through another period. But he's going to talk about designing efficient processor cores for multi-core networking. And I'm ad advertising this talk because it's very relevant to this class, I think. Uh, and I don't know exactly. I haven't attended this talk. But my guess is he's going to talk about how this processor is designed, what it is used for, uh, and how does it work, basically. And you're based on. Your knowledge in this class, you can ask them questions too. Uh, this is the abstract of the talk. I'm not going to go through this. We're going to send this out with the corrected uh, date. But uh, this is a processor designed for networking applications in particular. So I assume we'll learn a lot about how this application space shapes the requirements of the hardware itself. So it should be interesting. And I think there is a breakout session after that, uh, which uh, Provide some evaluation board hardware if you're interested in doing, in doing projects, for example, later on, not for this class, but for other classes. And evaluation board hardware for their processors and the software development kit and potential semester long student projects. I assume uh, there will be a brainstorming session to discuss this. So if you're interested in doing something in this space, this might be good to attend the breakout session. The talk is good to attend regardless. OK. And the paper is definitely good to read. I'll remind you of this paper uh, when we cover a lot of the concepts uh, that are covered in the paper. OK, last lecture, we've covered data dependence handling. Hopefully, you remember 
all of the different approaches. There are five fundamental approaches. I will briefly go over them. Again, today we're going to cover control dependence handling, and there are lots of approaches here too. Hopefully they're exciting approaches, uh, and we'll go through all of them, I think. Maybe not today, all of them. But just a review, how do we handle data dependencies? Uh, we discussed that anti and output dependencies are easier to handle. Right? These are dependencies on name. They're not dependencies on value. You're not communicating a value. You just have this dependent, artificial dependence because you don't have enough names for the registers. And if you write the register at the end of the pipeline, if you always write the register at the end of the pipeline, you can handle them nicely. But we've also seen a more sophisticated way of handling them, not stalling on these dependencies, right? You can actually get rid of these dependencies by renaming. Remember when we designed the scoreboard and one of you wanted to add a counter to the scoreboard? That's kind of a way of renaming, right? You're counting how many times this name is actually written to. And then you're decrementing when the name, uh, you, you write to the name. That's one way of renaming. And I described another way where you uh, map the register ID, the name itself. You have this register IDs. And this is the, your register file. You extend it with a tag, right? And this tag is the ID or sequence number of the instruction that's writing to that register. Basically, you're renaming the register ID to the instruction that's writing to that register. That's a form of renaming. And only that instruction is writing to the register file later on. Remember this when we discussed the sophisticated scoreboard? This is a form of renaming, and we will get back to this. So we basically eliminated the, this dependence by renaming the register ID to some other space, which is a tag space in this case, or instruction sequence number. In fact, if you look at the Alpha 21264 paper, they do something similar. They rename this register to some other space to get rid of these dependencies. And we did have the valid bit also, if you remember. OK, so we can get rid of these dependencies, and we'll get rid of them more aggressively uh, when we talk about out-of-word execution. And flow dependencies are more interesting, and we've seen five fundamental ways of handling them. I'll let you read it, but hopefully you know all of this by now. We're going to go into fine-grained multi-threading because it's actually more general. Actually, a lot of these are uh, the, the predict the needed values. You can handle the control dependencies that way also, right? We're going to predict uh, the needed value when we talk about control dependencies. For handling control dependencies, we're going to do something else also, right? So a lot of these are more general. Uh, than handling flow dependencies. Because control dependence, if you think about it, it's a special form of flow dependence also, right? It's a flow dependence on the program counter. OK? So some questions to ponder before we go into control dependencies. Uh, I guess we can spend the lecture on these questions, but <laughs> let's see what these questions are. What is the role of hardware and software in uh, dependence handling, in data dependence handling? I'm not, I'm not expecting an answer here right now, but remember we talked about software-based versus hardware-based interlocking. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each? Hopefully you know it by now. Right? Who, the key is who inserts or manages the pipeline bubbles. Right? If you think about it, software-based interlocking is if you don't have any independent instructions to insert, you basically insert a bubble, which is a no-op. Uh, and the key difference is basically who does this, software versus hardware. In software-based interlocking, it's the software. In hardware-based interlocking, it's the hardware. Uh, another way of asking the question is when you, have, when you get a data dependence, you have some potentially empty pipeline slots. Who fills those pipeline slots with useful instructions or no-ops? Right? If the hardware does that, then it's hardware-based interlocking. Okay. I'll let you think about it. This is, again, this course is all about hardware versus software, and you can do different things at different levels, right? Uh, and we've seen that software may, it may be difficult for the software to fill those bubbles, right? And we'll see more. Okay, I'll not answer all of these questions. But I'll talk about uh, what is the role of the hardware versus software in the order in which instructions are executed in the pipeline. Who determines that order? Right? If you have software-based instruction scheduling, we call it sc static scheduling. 
Software specifies order of instructions, and hardware obeys that. If you have hardware-based instruction scheduling, we will see that this is dynamic scheduling. Software specifies an order, but hardware underneath executes instructions based on order it would like to execute instructions to, for example, tolerate latency. If, a, if an instruction takes too long, the hardware finds an independent instruction to, instruction to execute. So let's take a look at the static scheduling a little bit. We remember at the beginning of the lecture last time, uh, we discussed uh, how you can schedule instructions from a different basic block, how you can move the load, hoist the load up so that you can tolerate its latency. Uh, this, this is what's called static scheduling. Basically, compiler orders the instructions. It doesn't have to be the compiler. As, a, as an assembly programmer, you order the instructions, right? Uh, and hardware executes them in that order. And we will contrast this with dynamic scheduling, in which the hardware executes the instructions uh, out of the compiler specified order. So one key issue in static scheduling is, how does the compiler know the latency of each instruction, right? If the compiler knew the latency of each instruction, this would probably be easy, right? Especially if you have data dependencies, let's say, you have a multiply. Uh, I guess multiply may not be the easiest example, although it could happen also. Let's start with an easy example, easier example. Even within the same basic block, you have a load instruction, let's say, and you have a dependent add. And if you want to utilize the pipeline well, what you would like to do is, uh, if the compiler knows the latency of this load instruction, it can schedule the add far apart and put independent instructions in between the load and add, such that the pipeline is full with useful instructions. The problem is, it's difficult for the compiler to know this latency. It could be 50 cycles sometimes. With modern hierarchies, if it's a cache hit, maybe it's a two cycle load. Maybe if it's a second level or third level cache, it's 50 cycles. Maybe it's a ca if it's a cache miss, it's 1,000 cycles. Right? So it's difficult to know. It's difficult to schedule instructions because of this. So this is one example that makes static scheduling hard. Right? The compiler doesn't know the latency. So what does the compiler do? Maybe it, uh, it uh, tries to provision for the worst case latency, but that's probably not a good idea. Right? How, do you, how do you move the slow the 1,000 cycles before? Well, first of all, you have branches, right? You have some other control flow getting into uh, this basic block. So maybe moving the load up is, a, is not a good idea. Maybe it's, it's, that load is not going to be executed. And you have dependencies feeding that load. Maybe it's not even possible right, to move load uh, so high. So this variable latency uh, makes the problem hard. So what does the compiler do? The compiler profiles the code, right? And we've seen that. By profiling the code, it may figure out that this load always hits based on the input set. In that case, the compiler assumes that the latency is 2. Right? But then you still need to somehow handle, it, handle the case when it's a miss. Right? If the profile input set is not correct, then you will get uh, that scheduling will not work well. OK. So this is one example of the information that the compiler doesn't know that makes static scheduling hard. What else is there? I've already given you one. Actually, to be more specific, what is this? The compiler doesn't know the latency, right? Because the latency is variable. So the compiler doesn't know the, how long it'll take, so it cannot schedule instructions. If the latency is deterministic, for example, if you have a multiply, that always takes three cycles. The compiler's life is much easier, right? The latency is the same depend regardless of the input set, regardless of what the program does. So scheduling is easier. So one, the answer to the first answer to this is variable latency operations. The compiler doesn't know that latency. So loads are one example. Can you think of other examples? What other instructions are variable latency? Or could be variable latency. Design multiplier or divider variable latency. Exactly. How so? Um, if it's a 
if it works through one of the operands in a serial fashion until all that's left of that operand is zeros. Mm -hmm. If it's if you're multiplying by two, mm -hmm. and it's a 32-bit number, you'll get an answer after two cycles. You could easily have to wait 32 cycles. That's right. Yeah, exactly. You could design something like a multiply uh, to have variable latency. One, one simple example, for example, you could detect whether you're multiplying by zero, right? And if you detect that one of the operands is zero, maybe the answer can be returned in one cycle, right? Assuming you can do that zero detection in one cycle. But you could even be more sophisticated depending on when, you, when the multiply should stop. You could detect that perhaps, right? Or you could detect whether you're multiplying by uh, or dividing by uh, a power of two, right? Then you can convert the multiply to a shift. And there have been processors that had this kind of multipliers and dividers that had variable latency. Now this complicates the compiler's job if the compiler is doing the scheduling. So many operations can be variable latency. Uh, what else? What else does the compiler not know? We're done with the latency. Yes? Doesn't some of this a function of the underlying implementation? So for each processor that's running this ISA, the compiler would have to know a little bit about the underlying implementation just to schedule properly? That's right, yeah. We're, we're assuming that it knows that. You're right. The compiler does need to know, for example, what the pipeline should look like in order to ensure that the pipeline is full. But even, even after it knows that, there's some information it doesn't know that makes scheduling difficult. Anything else you can guess? I guess to be more general, the compiler doesn't know the dynamic events, right? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. <laughs> This latency is variable based on a dynamic event. What is that dynamic event? Dynamic means happens at runtime, right? By definition, compiler is not operating at runtime. It operates before runtime, at compile time. This latency is variable because at runtime, this load happens to miss in the cache or hit in the cache. This latency could be variable because at runtime, one of the operands might be 0 or 2. What are the dynamic events that the compiler doesn't know? Branching. See? Branching. branching. It's specifically, that's where the branch goes, right? Exactly. So this is number one. The second is branch direction, right? So why does this matter? You have a branch here. You go this way or this way. The compiler wants to schedule instructions. Well, can you, for example, move this load up here? Or can you move some other instructions up? The compiler doesn't know whether this branch will go this way or this way, right? Or maybe you want to move instructions down sometimes. And we will see why so later on. Or you can imagine why so. The compiler doesn't know if this branch is taken or not taken. Now, that movement is dangerous, right? You don't want to be incorrect when you're doing that movement. So that direction is determined dynamically, well, specifically conditional branching, right? <laughs> that branching on some condition, the compiler doesn't know. So it becomes harder to move the code. So what does the compiler do? Again, it profiles the code and figures out the likely path. If this branch is 99% taken, the compiler generates code that could generate code that actually assumes that these two basic blocks are executed uh, consecutively. But also, you need to insert code that checks if that's not the case dynamically, right? So that's the, that's the idea. So the compiler doesn't know the branch direction, and that hinders code optimizations. What is the third thing? I'll give you a price to someone who <laughs> gives me this answer in the next lecture. Yes? Exception control flow. No, I, I wonder if you <laughs> say it again. If you if you take an interrupt right after the load, then the load will complete. Okay. If you take an interrupt right, you could take an interrupt. Take basically. take an interrupt basically coming from some other device. Right. Yeah, that's right. But that that doesn't hurt the instruction scheduling, right? Because it's an external event. Okay. So the compiler can still. That's an external event that can be handled some other time. You're right. The compiler doesn't know that absolutely. 
But for instruction scheduling purposes, it doesn't matter that much. Actually, it doesn't matter. But there's one more thing that the compiler doesn't know. Yes? That's right. But that, that in turn affects this variable latency probably, right? Because if it knew the cache size, maybe it can predict whether a load will hit in the cache or miss in the cache. That's true, but yeah, that was uh, his point. There, there's something about the instruction execution that the compiler doesn't know. Think, think memory instructions. Memory is always a problem. <laughs> yes? Um, is that there if the address given is going to memory or I.O. devices? OK. You're thinking of a speci specific case, but you're, you're on the right track. The, the, does the compiler know the address of a memory instruction? No, right? So if, you do, if you're doing a load, now if you register, the compiler knows the address of the registers. It assigns the address of the registers. But the address of loads or stores, the compiler really has no idea. So that's the third fundamental thing, the memory address. Now why is this important in instruction scheduling? Because if it's aligned, it's faster. It's what? So that could be true, yes, that, that could be true actually. For example, if you have a load, and if it's, I wasn't thinking of that, but, uh, and it's, it's unaligned, it may take this many cycles, and if it's aligned, it may take that many cycles, right? Okay. But that leads to variable latency. That you could decide in compile time, you can make everything aligned. That's right, yeah, if you can do that. But it, for example, if you have a store here, and a load here, and store somehow computes its address, and load somehow computes its address. You're doing instruction scheduling. You want to order instructions. Can you move this load above the store? If you don't know the addresses, you don't, you don't know, right? So this restricts, this also restricts compiler's ability in sc static scheduling. Now there are many ways people try to overcome this in compilers, and if we get to it, uh, we can talk about it, but unlikely that we're going to cover that in this course. So these are the three fundamental reasons. Compiler doesn't know the operation latency. It's usually the load latency, load hit miss latency. That's problematic, but it could be other operations also. The branch direction and the memory address. Okay. Well, I guess anything that's determined about an instruction at runtime, and these are the three major things. Remind me, I should give you a <laughs> prize. <laughs> OK, any questions? Or if you come up with something else, let me know. But think about it. If, if something else translates to variable latency, then it's covered by the variable latency. OK, I guess how can the compiler alleviate this? And you've already seen the answer, right? Basically, how can it estimate the unknown? Basically, all of these are unknown. But we still want to do good instruction scheduling to keep the pipeline full. How can we alleviate this? And the answer is profiling. Right. You profile the code. Well, this is one answer, actually. We will see another answer. Uh, I don't want to give it right now uh, when we talk about branch handling. But this is a very common answer. You profile the code with some input set. Check what is the latency. If it's most of the time at one cycle operation, good. We can schedule nicely. Check what is the branch direction? If it's most of the time taken, going this way, you can assume most of the time you're going to execute this and optimize the code that way. But of course, you need to handle the case where the code goes this way. Right? And those are the cases where you need to uh, put some So somehow, dynamically, you need to detect. There needs to be code that detects this branch is actually going this way. So there needs to be some fix-up code that undoes what the compiler did to optimize the code here. Right. In memory address, again, the compiler can profile the code. For example, one profiling mechanism could be to figure out how many times the addresses of the store and load actually are the same in the, during execution. And if all the time when you profile the code, you find out that these are different addresses, then 
uh, the compiler can't reorder the code, uh, reorder this load over the store, right? Does that make sense? So profiling is a powerful way of uh, overcoming the disadvantages a compiler has. Now the difficulty is how do you get your input set to be representative? And that's the Achilles heel of profiling or static uh, optimizations. Okay, we'll get back to this when we talk about branch prediction actually. We'll see mechanisms to do branch prediction with profiling. Any questions on this? Okay, okay, let's jump to control dependence handling now. This slide you've seen before. What should, basically the basic question is what should the fetch PC be in the next cycle? Well, of course it should be the address of the next instruction you're gonna execute and all instructions are control dependent on the previous ones. If the fetch instruction is a non-control instruction, non-control flow instruction, next fetch PC is the next sequential instruction. So it's easy. It's easy to determine if you know the size of the fetched instruction. We've discussed this. If the instruction that is fetched is a control flow instruction, then how do we determine the next fetch PC? And in fact, how do we even know that the instruction we're fetching is a control flow instruction, right? At the time of fetch, we don't know. So in this lecture, we're going to try to solve this problem in many different ways. But let's remember what we have, what we're dealing with, really. These are different kinds of branch types or conditional instruction types or, or control flow instruction types. And we're going to mainly concern ourselves with the conditional branches. Uh, but at some point, we're going to talk about these other ones also. So if you think of a conditional branch, the direction of the branch, whether it's taken or not taken, is unknown, right, at fetch time. And the number of possible next fetch addresses is two. It's either PC plus four, PC plus instruction size, or the target of the branch. And the fetch address is resolved usually after execution of the branch, because usually these branches are register dependent. They don't have to be. Or uh, they could be program counter dependent also. So actually in, in MIPS it's program counter dependent, right? The condition is regi register dependent, but the target address uh, is program counter dependent, which means that the fetch address is actually resolved after you read the register. Right? So you need to have the register. So unconditional branches, they're easier, right? They're always taken at fetch time, and there's only one possible next fetch address. And usually the next fetch address is resolved after decode stage because they're always taken. Uh, and, and the next fetch address is usually PC plus offset. Calls, they're also always taken, and their number of uh, possible fetch addresses is one, so you can resolve them in decode also. Returns are a little bit different. They're actually indirect branches, right? If you think about the return instruction MIPS. They're always taken again, but their target addresses could be many, right? Because there can be one call, uh, many call sites uh, that you can return to that are calling a function. So think about how to actually execute these instructions, how to predict a return instruction when you fetch, fetch it. And we'll talk about it. This is actually easier to handle. And I'll let you think why it's easier to handle. Even though it's uh, resolved after execution because you need to get the register to put into the program counter, right? Okay, indirect branches, these are uh, one of the hardest ones actually. The uh, it's indirect, the direction is always taken, but the target can be many because the target address comes from a register. Basically, indirect branch, uh, I guess I'll create an instruction, jump indirect, R7, for example. Basically, this changes program counter to R7. Same jump That's right, yes. It's like jump register. Their target is many, and they're resolved after you read R7. Well, R7's value is not available at fetch stage, right? So these are hard to predict. Think about how you can actually fill the pipeline when you fetch an indirect branch. But we'll get back to that. I, I distinguish between returns and indirects here. You can see that returns are actually the same as indirects, right? Except with returns, you have some hint, or you could have some hint, potentially. If your program is nicely written, hopefully, at some point, you made a call, and then you're returning to that place, right? And hopefully, this looks like a stack, right? 
which means that if you remember the linkages that you made in the calls on a stack, when you make the call, push the, target, uh, push the ins next instruction address onto a stack. When you make the next call, push the next instruction address onto a stack. When you make the next call, push the next instruction address onto a stack. When you see the return, pop the stack and predict that this, uh, next, this, uh, this value on the stack as the next PC. When you see the next return, pop the stack again and predict this as the next PC. When you see the next return, predict this as the, at the top of the stack as the next PC. So it's relatively easy to do. In fact, existing processors do this. This is called the call return stack. And it's a hardware stack that predicts the target out of the return instructions. Okay, I guess I've given you the idea already, high level idea. But this will become more clear when we get to it and do the same thing again. So that's why returns are different from indirect branches. But indirect branch could be something like this, right? Load, I like R7, I guess, some memory address, and then jump R7, I guess jump register. Here you have no clue, right? Or maybe you don't have any clue. Certainly not, no clue from the program. That's why these are much harder to handle. But let's not concern ourselves with these first. Let's look at conditional branches. But actually, even before that. So it's basically uh, all of these are control dependencies. Right? Some of them may be harder to handle. But it's critical to keep the pipeline full with the correct sequence of dynamic instructions. Right? So how many solutions can you think of? The simplest solution is no solution, right? You stole the pipeline until we know the next fetch address. That is the problem. <laughs> we're trying to solve. But you could implement this. The second is guess the next fetch address. This is called uh, branch prediction also. Or more accurately, next fetch address prediction. You're really predicting the next fetch address. Employ delayed branching, branch delay slot. We talked about this, and we'll cover this in a little bit more. Uh, this is another solution, which is probably not a good solution. Do something else will be other solution, fine grain multi-threading. And we'll cover this in more detail. Uh, you could eliminate control flow instructions. That eliminates the problem, right? If these instructions gives you, causes trouble, why don't we get rid of them? So how do you do that is a question. And you already, we've already talked about predicated execution, right? That's one way of eliminating control flow instructions. We'll see some other ways. And another way is actually you can actually fetch from multiple paths and discard one. Right. So when you get to a branch, and if you somehow figure out it's a branch, and if you somehow figure out the, what are the targets, why don't we fetch from both paths at the same time? And when we know where the branch actually is going, we discard the path that we've uh, fetched incorrectly. So this requires more hardware, but people have actually talked about this. It's multi-path execution. OK. So let's take a look at some of these solutions. Let's start with the non-solution, although I'm not going to uh, spend much time. But stall fetch until next PC is available. Is this a good idea? No, right? <laughs> I guess it depends on what your design point is again. If, if, the, if you don't care about the performance of the solution, then maybe it's a good idea. Right? But basically, uh, if you want to strictly obey this, even with, uh, with the pipeline we've discussed, even with a non-control flow instruction, you'll get a bubble. Because you're fetching the instruction, you do not know. Uh, you, you basically do not want, do not know if it's a branch or not branch, right? Basically, you do not know if it's a, if the next instruction is PC plus four or a target. You really know that at the end of the decode stage of the first instruction because you've decoded uh, uh, decoded the instruction. Let's assume that it's a non-control flow instruction. Now you can fetch the next instruction. So even with a non-control flow instruction, if you strictly want to obey this, you get a single bubble. So it's a bad idea to do this. Make sense? Because you're not utilizing the pipeline. 50% of the time, you're injecting bubbles into your pipeline. Not a good idea. Yes? OK, so how do we do better? 
Well, rather than waiting for the true dependence on PC to resolve, which is what we did here, basically. We're trying to resolve the true dependence on the program counter here. And this is the case of a non-control flow or unconditional branch instruction. Basically, guess next PC is PC plus 4, assuming that next instruction is sequ next sequential instruction. Is this a good guess? It is probably a good guess, right? Assuming most of the time the next instruction is the next sequential instruction. Well, what do you lose if you guessed incorrectly? Let's take a look. Uh, let's assume that 20% of your instruction mix is control flow. Basically, it's a, some kind of branch. And this is a good number, actually. It, it keeps changing. It's dependent on your ISA also. Uh, but, and uh, you, can, you can think of 90% uh, of the backward control flow, a loop branch, as taken. And 50% of the forward control flow is taken. These are some empirical numbers that people have collected. Uh, I don't know if they hold anymore. But if you assume this, uh, some people have done, uh, this is uh, Lee and Smith's paper on branch target buffers, actually, uh, that some people discover that typically in those programs in 1980s, 70% of the branches are taken and 30% of the branches are not taken. And you could imagine why so, right? If you have lots of loops, it's more likely that uh, loops that are iterated frequently, if you, you're, it's more likely that the branches are taken. So if you make these assumptions, this means that next PC equals PC plus 4 is a correct guess 86% of the time. When you have an instruction, 86% of the time, the next instruction is PC plus 4. How did we come up with 86%? Well, 80% of the time, it's correct because you don't have a control flow instruction. 20% of the time, you have a control flow instruction. And 30% of that 20% is actually taken, uh, not taken, right? So you get 86%. But remain, remaining 14% of the time, you would be mispredicting if you actually say next PC is PC plus 4, if you predict that. Is this good enough? I guess is 86% of the time good enough, given these numbers? These are all average numbers. May not be, right? Well, let's take a look. Uh, so, so what do you do with the remaining 14%? This is a very nice prediction mechanism because it's simple, right? You don't need to change much in the processor. If you, if you do the wrong thing, you need to somehow correct yourself. And how do you correct yourself? Basically, you flush what you fetched and refetch from the correct target address, correct next instruction. And we will get to that also. Uh, but that's, you, you've seen the pipeline flush, right? Basically, flush means get rid of incorrect instruction, incorrectly fetched instructions from the pipeline. So when you mispredict the branch, you figure that out in the uh, execute stage, and you need to get rid of everything in the previous pipe stages. And you need to re redirect the fetch engine. It's also called redirect the fetch engine to the correct next fetch address. So this is the cost of guessing. You need to have logic to do this. So it doesn't come for free. Guessing doesn't come for free. But if you're guessing, this is the easiest form of guessing. Right? This is also called always taken, uh, always not taken prediction. Right? You're predicting that if it's a control flow, if, if, the, if you're, what you're fetching is a control flow instruction, it's always not taken. Right? It's the simplest form of branch prediction. So the question is, is this good enough? And I'll show you that this is not good enough. Because basically, you're, uh, well, if you think about it, Actually, let's do the calculation. Let's say you have nice IPC. You have, a, you have a pipeline, and you're retiring one instructions per cycle. Uh, or you have one cycles per instruction, let's say. That's the, uh, that's, a, that's the pipeline we've seen with nice throughput, right? Every cycle. Now, at 14% of the time, you're not doing that. 14% of the time, what's happening is you're wasting some cycles. 
So basically, 0 0.14, uh, let's say how many cycles are you wasting? That depends on how many things you're flushing. This is called the misprediction penalty. So 14% of the time, you're actually adding some number of cycles. And if this number of cycles is huge, then you're increasing your CPI. Right? So what's your CPI? It's good. 1 plus 0 0.14. Assuming your misprediction penalty is, let's say, 2 cycles, your CPI quickly goes to 1.28. Right? If your misprediction penalty is 5 cycles, if your branch is resolved, if you have a deeper pipeline, this becomes 1.7. Right? If your misprediction penalty is 10 cycles, then now your CPI is doubled all quickly. Right? Even with a prediction accuracy of 86% of the time, you get the correct instruction. This is not the prediction accuracy for all branches, of course. Right? Uh, this is the prediction accuracy for, across all instructions. So we're going to get to this. So this is not good enough, because your prediction accuracy for the branches is actually only 30%. Right? You're predicting correctly only 30% of your branches. So we'd like to fix this. But let's see how far we can actually get with uh, next PC, P, uh, PC plus 4. Can we make this uh, do better? Okay, I think I already talked about this. How can you make this more effective? We're going to use this prediction mechanism, but we're going to make this more effective. Any ideas? The hardware implements this. How do you change the software to, for this to become more effective? So reverse the way you're <coughs> Exactly. Yes. How so? You always want to jump out, and if you're, if you're doing the loop, you still have to go forward. That's right, yeah. So that's the basic idea. Maximize the chances that the next sequential instruction is the next instruction to be executed. And put it another way, right? That's what you're doing, basically. So, or reorder the code, or lay out the control flow graph such that the likely next instruction is on the not taken path of a branch. Remember the control flow graph? I'll draw it again. You have this branch. It goes two ways. And uh, let's say compiler figures out that this branch is actually taken 95% of the time. And it's not taken 5% of the time. Well, if your prediction mechanism in hardware is always not taken, the compiler can do something simple, right? Compiler can do that, right? It can put the code anywhere it wants. And then fix up, of course, the branch target somehow. Basically, now you increase your prediction accuracy for this branch by how many times? 19x. So that's the idea. Lay out the code such that the likely next instruction is on the not taken path. And this is the likely next instruction. And how do you determine likely next instruction? By profiling. OK? So this is actually used by many, many compilers. And there is a famous paper that describes this, Pettis and Hansen, and other benefits of this. It's called Profile Guided Code, code Positioning. I think it's PLDI 1990. This is programming language design and implementation. And that's the basic idea. Simple, right? And many compilers do this today. Yes? Another way that could be done is for the programmer to specify if the statement is likely to be taken or not taken, which is actually done in a lot in low level programming languages. Like, like the, in the Linux kernel, you have likely and unlikely statements within the if statement. So that that's right, exactly. Yeah. So the question is how do you actually determine what is, the, uh, what is the likely path? The programmer can give that hint also if you have that, uh, if, if, if you have that bit in the, uh, uh, if, you, if you have that mechanism in the programming language. Exactly. So there are many ways of actually determining what is the likely path. The question is, is it representative? Right? <laughs> OK? So that's the idea. So you can make this actually more effective uh, if you can do this. Actually, can the hardware do this if there is no information? I think I'll let you think about it. I don't want to go into that much depth. But actually, hardware can potentially reorder the instructions as well, assuming you have a cache. Hardware can cache the instructions in the order they're executed 
And next time, fetch the instructions in the order they were seen before. That way, you don't need to. Uh, basically, in hardware, uh, you can store, let's say, let's say these are your basic blocks, A, B, C. And most of the time, you're executing something like this, A, B, D. What the hardware can do is rec recognize that and store A, B, D together in its cache. That way, you overcome the compiler constraint, right? The hardware itself is now fetching sequential instructions. So what have we done? Basically, what, what we've done is, well, even if this was not, even if this is taken, basically the hardware is storing consecutive basic blocks that were executed consecutively in consecutive locations in the cache. This way, it doesn't need to predict the branch. And this is the concept of trace cache. I'll not go into in detail, but if you've heard the term trace cache, that's what it is. It's really uh, storing a trace of instructions and refetching that trace of instructions the next time it sees it. That way, it's, the code is all sequential in the cache. OK? So if you don't understand this, don't worry about it. But understand the software part for sure. Yes? One way that could be done is um, using virtual machines, right? You, you have Java bytecode that runs at uh, one time that the virtual machine can identify you know, the which branches are hot and lay them out yeah. at the runtime. Basically. And that's, that's exactly the same as the yeah, compiler, same. right? Your compiler can be a static compiler or a dynamic compiler. That's a dynamic compiler. OK. So how else can you make this more effective? This is one way. <laughs> there are actually many ways you can make this more effective. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've already given you this, right? Get rid of control flow instructions, right? So how can you get rid of control flow instructions? Conditional loads. Conditional loads, or in general, conditional instructions, right? Or predicated execution, basically. That's one way. There are actually other ways, programmer level ways also, right? You can get rid of unnecessary control flow instructions. And we'll see this example. You can combine predicates. And I'll, 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 give you, uh, I'll tell you uh, in the next slide what I mean. And the second is what you've said. Basically, you can control. If you do not have a control dependence, uh, if you convert e every control dependence into a data dependence, then you've gotten rid of control, control flow instructions. Right? Basically, that's what predicate execution is. It converts the control dependence into a data dependence. And we'll take a look at that. But before that, let's take a look at a simpler case. This is not, a pre this is not predicate execution. This is what's called predicate combining. And this is another optimization compiler or the programmer can do. So you can have a complex predicate like this, right? If a equals b and c less than d and a is greater than 5,000, do something. You could generate three conditional branches in this code, right? The problem with this is it increases the number of control dependencies. The likelihood of mispredicting each, mispredicting each branch, uh, mispredicting a branch becomes higher because you have more branches just because of that. Well, you don't need to have three conditional branches when you actually uh, generate the code. You can combine the predicate operations to feed a single branch instruction, right? Instead of having one branch for each. Does that make sense? So what do you do, basically? Uh, you could do this on, well, you need some general purpose registers or condition registers to operate on. So somehow your instructions need to uh, do the predication. Uh, well, not predication. Somehow you need to have instructions to operate on these predicates. Basically, you have compare A, B. That's your predicate one. Is that true? Is it A, B? Yeah, A, B. Compare equal, I guess. And then you have compare less than C, D, and then that's your predicate 2. Or let's say condition 1, and then condition 2. And your condition 3 is, is that compare greater than? 
compare greater than A5000. And then you have a condition 4 that basically ends these three conditions. Uh, well, how do you do that? I guess you can have and condition 1, condition 2. I guess you could be uh, less wasteful, but condition 4 uh, and condition 4. What is this? Condition 3. Okay? And then branch on condition 5. I guess branch equal, right? Or branch 0, branch not 0. Is it branch 0? I guess branch not 0, if the condition 5 is true. So now you have a single branch instead of three branches, right? In fact, uh, you don't need to. Some ISAs, like the power PC, power ISA, provides condition registers such that you can directly manipulate these condition registers. When you do the compare, they actually set different bits in a single register so that you can get rid of these two operations also. Does that make sense? Basically, if you have a single register that you manipulate when you do these compares and set different bits in that single register, you can get rid of these two operations and check that condition register, check the corresponding bits in, the, uh, in that condition register. So you can make this nicer. And uh, that's the advantage of a condition register instead of a general purpose register. You could do this with general purpose registers also, right? Register 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK. So what is the advantage of this? Basically, we've gotten rid of uh, two of these branches in this code. And it could be more. I think I already told you the idea. Fewer branches, fewer misprediction and stalls. What is the disadvantage? None? As with everything else, there must be a disadvantage here also, right? That's right, yeah. Now your, your uh, code size could increase, that's right. Maybe you meant something else. That's right, code size potentially could increase, but I'm not sure. Because you'll have branches otherwise, right? Yes? Well, you also don't get like short circuit evaluation. That's right, yes. What if this condition all, all already evaluates to false, right? Now you're doing useless work. You're waiting. You, if, if this condition evaluates to false, you know that this will be false and you're not going to take the branch. But in this case, there's no way you can get rid of that. Uh, you, can, you, you know that. Right? Basically, you can possibly get unnecessary work. So if the first predicate is false, there's no need to compute other predicates. But if you combine the predicates, too bad. OK, so these condition registers actually exist in IBM RS6000 and the power architecture also. That, those enable these condition manipulation. Uh, uh, fast condition manipulation such that you can get rid of instructions. This is another place where ISA actually helps, right? Okay. So predicate execution, we will cover this in a little bit more detail, but let's take a look at that also. This is another way of eliminating branches. It's different from this. This is not predicate execution. This is really combining predicates. You still have branches to jump. The idea is simple. Control, uh, convert control dependence to data dependence. And suppose we had a conditional move instruction like this. You have conditional move based on some condition. It could be a condition code, condition register, or a general purpose register based on that condition being true or false. R2 is moved to R1. Otherwise, R1 is left alone. You don't move. This is a form of predicate execution. Basically, if the predicate is true, this condition is true, move R2 to R1. Otherwise, don't move R2 to R1. We can express this in C this way, right? And this is actually employed in most modern ISAs. This is a form of predicate execution that's done in alpha, x86, you know, conditional moves. So what's the benefit of this? Let's take a look at this uh, example I cooked up. If A is equal to 5, B is equal to 4, otherwise B is equal to 3. You could have it with a branch. If you have it with a branch, what does it look like? I'm not efficiently utilizing these boards. So you have, uh, you have some condition, R1, A equals 5. And then you compare uh, 0 
R1. Based on that, you go this way or this way. And then B equals 4 or B equals 3. Right? If you have conditional moves, you basically get rid of this branch. Right? This is what the code looks like. You basically compare uh, if a is equal to 5 and set this, uh, uh, set this condition. right? And based on the condition, you conditionally move. You conditionally move 4 to b if the condition is true. And you conditionally move uh, 3 to b if the condition is true. No more branch. Right? If you look at this, you have a single basic block, right? instead of having three basic blocks here. Beautiful, right? We got rid of the branch. Um, yes? You capture this move That's right, yeah. So you can, you can actually be <laughs> more smart, right? <laughs> Perhaps. Actually, this is if the condition is not true, you move b to 3. Uh, that's right. You can be more smart here. So that way, you, you eliminate the dependence on the condition. That's right, yes. It is, it is more complicated than a normal move. And you can th start thinking about why it's more complicated, because it has more operands, right? It has to have the condition. It has to have this operand, and it has to have this operand. So it has three operands, actually. OK? Mm. So what is the benefit of this? So OK, let's think about, actually, first, what does it require? It requires somehow instructions to be supplied as conditional operands. This is, the, this is called the predicate. Right? So you need some predicate registers in the ISA to enable this. So you need to change the ISA. That's one downside. But let's think, let's think about the upsides first. Upside is you eliminate branches, so you get straight line code, as we've seen. No more. Uh, multiple different basic blocks. You get a single basic block. So what are the advantages of this? We've already seen that uh, always taken, actually this should be always not taken. Always not taken, next PC prediction works better now, right? Because you, you always have sequential code. Because you have no branches. But there's one more benefit based on what we've discussed earlier. Right? Now compile has more freedom to optimize code. Right? No branches, branches are gone. So the compiler doesn't need to know where the branches, where branches, uh, if a branch is taken or not taken. Right? You have straight line code. And if you can actually make your basic blocks larger by eliminating all of the branches in your code, isn't that great? You have a lot of freedom in scheduling instructions with the compiler. Of course, this comes at a cost, right? Well, control flow basically doesn't hinder instruction reordering optimizations, and code optimizations now are hindered only by the data dependencies. The compiler needs to obey only the data dependencies. The disadvantage is you get useless work. Right? Here, for example, maybe this is not the best example, but you, you still get useless work here. Because, this is not the best example because you have only one instructions that are dependent on the, only one instruction uh, in each basic block that's dependent on the branch. So some instructions that you fetch and execute are always discarded. Think about it, which is not the case if you predict the branch correctly. If you predicted the branch correctly here, you never touch this part. Whereas here, you're always fetching both paths, which leads to always wasted work. And that's why it's actually difficult to what I just suggested earlier. Compiler has more freedom to optimize code, because if you want to give a compiler more freedom to optimize code, you would like to do this for the entire control flow graph, right? These are your different branches in your control flow graph. Let's say it looks like this. I don't know, maybe I'll add one more. Why not? 
So you can predict the branches. Or if you want to optimize the code, maybe you combine this entire thing into a single basic block. Right? How do you do that? Basically, eliminate all of these data dependencies, predicate all of them. Now, predicate computation becomes more complicated. Think about it. You're down here. Now you have, you're dependent on multiple predicates. So you have a huge basic block. The downside is if you're executing A, B, C, D, now you've code from all of these different basic blocks inside this huge predicated block. So you still have the wasted work. The upside is maybe this code is smaller, right? Because maybe compiler, by looking at this entire picture, eliminated some instructions. That is possible. Maybe, for example, there's redundancy. This, this path computes A plus B, and this path also happens to compute A plus B. And the compiler can much more easily get rid of those and put them into a single register earlier. OK? So think about these trade-offs. We'll get back to predicated execution. But this useless work uh, makes it hard uh, to combine many blocks. And it requires additional ISA support. I guess this is a question for you. Can we eliminate all branches this way? Wouldn't life be nice if we eliminate everything, every single control flow instruction? Say it again. Direct jumps. Some conditions. Direct jumps. You could potentially eliminate them, but they, but those are not a problem, right? Because really, it's a, it's the conditional branches that cause a problem. Direct jumps, you know the target. What do you think? What branches can we not eliminate? Yes? That's right, yeah. How do you eliminate a loop branch? Yes? Recursion, that's, uh, that's, uh, that is implemented using loops. So, yes, looping is the basic. Basically, backward branches, more generally. You need a backward branch for, to implement both of those constructs. And I don't know how you can actually get rid of a backward branch in those constructs. So you could unroll the loop, meaning that you, you basically put multiple iterations together, but there has to be a branch somewhere that checks whether you, uh, whether you should exit the loop. Okay? So all branches cannot be eliminated this way. I think before I move on, uh, I'd like you to think a little bit more about like, the concept of data flow also here. If you think about it, data flow has no control dependence, right? If you think about those inputs, uh, those nodes that we looked at, you have a control node, and everything is data. There is no control in data flow. Essentially, predicate execution tries to approximate that data flow somehow. How? Well, you have these registers as data flow that really control your control, depending on which paradigm you start with. From a, if you start with a von Neumann, control flow machine, then basically you're incorporating more data flow to get rid of that control flow instructions. You're still sequential though, right? OK. So data flow actually eliminates all branches. But then the fundamental paradigm is different, right? Branches exist because we're thinking about a sequential machine. Data flow, there's no branch concept to begin with. That's why it's gone. I think enough of this philosophy. But <laughs> think about it that way. Uh, and um, there, there's a lot of similarities between data flow and predicated execution. OK. OK, we will get back to this. Uh, I'll give you some readings. Actually, this is, a, uh, this is a nice paper. This is the first paper that introduced predicated execution, conversion of control dependence to data dependence, principles of programming language in 1983. And this is a paper we did. Maybe we'll talk about it. It's wish branches. The idea is maybe sometimes you want branches, sometimes you want predicated execution. Right? When do you want branches? So here, for example, if you are able to predict these branches accurately, you really don't want predicated execution. Right? If you're unable to predict these branches, if this branch prediction is 50% accuracy, it's really a random flip. Maybe you do want predicated execution. Right? 
Maybe you do want to execute both paths. That's the idea with wish branches. You estimate if your prediction accuracy is going to be high, if you're able to predict this branch accurately. If yes, then you choose branch prediction. If no, then you choose predicate execution. Well, the code needs to be generated such that you can, ex you you can do both, right? So you have a special instruction that is able to execute both ways. OK? We'll get back to this when we cover branch prediction. Because doing predicate execution for all branches is not a good idea because if you have a very easy to predict branch, you can easily predict it, right? OK. Any questions? Should we take a break? Now let's, let's take a break for, uh, I guess, three minutes. <laughs> let's, let's be back at 1.40. So, so far, we've covered stall the pipeline, guess the next fetch address, eliminate control flow instructions, but we'll get back to that. Let's look at employee delayed branching. We've covered this before. You guys all remember, right, delayed branches? Branch delay slots? OK, so I'll go through this fast. Basically, the idea is to change the semantics of a branch instruction such that branch takes effect after n instructions or n cycles. Um, in, in MIPS, it's one instruction, right? n is one. The next instruction is always executed. The next sequential instruction is always executed. Uh, the problem is how do you find instructions to fill the delay slot? That's one problem, right? Uh, basically, branch must be independent of the delay slot instructions, right? If you have an unconditional branch, it's easier to find instructions because you basically take, the, for example, the first instruction in the target, and you change the target to be the next instruction after the target. You fill the delay slot. But if you have a conditional branch, now your condition computation should not depend on instructions in the delay slots, right? Which means that it's more difficult to fill the delay slot. Now you can imagine this. Well, let's take a look at the benefit of the delayed branching. So this is my cartoon for you. We have a two-stage pipeline. Because with a single delay slot, actually, a two-stage pipeline works nicely. Or a single delay slot works nicely in a two-stage pipeline, put another way. Uh, you have a timeline fetch and execute. This is our normal code, ABC, and a branch conditional X. And these are the data dependencies that we care about here. And this is the target of the branch, G. These are instructions. Uh, let's look at the timeline for this. If, we look at, uh, if you look at this, this is not this normal code, no, no delayed branches, which means that D is not executed semantically uh, after this branch. A is fetched uh, first, and then while A is being executed, B is fetched. This is how you fill the pipeline. When you get to the branch, well, you stall right until the branch is resolved. So you have one cycle bubble, you have six cycle execution. Whereas if you have delayed branch, what you can do is you can, now the branch semantics has changed. Uh, the instruction that's sequentially after the branch is always executed. How do we fill the slot? Well, if you look at this, you cannot put A and C after the branch because branch computation depends on A and C. You cannot put G over here because you do not know if the branch is always taken. So the only option you can have here is putting B, right? in the delay slot. And you're lucky that you have that option here. So you can fill the delay slot with B. So how does this work? Basically, you execute A. And then while you're executing A, you fetch C. And while you're fetching, executing C, you fetch the branch. And while the branch is being executed, now you're fetching the instruction in the delay slot because you're always going to execute that anyway. Now your pipeline is always full. Right? And branch takes effect the next cycle after one, one instruction. So it's five cycles now. You've saved one cycle, right? Yes. So the branch takes effect after a delay. And the delay is one cycle or one instruction. OK. So that's the idea. Nice, right? Now think about how, when the pipeline becomes deeper. If your pipeline has five stages and the branch resolves after the th third stage, you need to have more delay slots, right? But you don't have the delay slot because your ISA specified only one delay slot. 
What do you do with those two other cycles that you need to fill the instructions with? Well, employ some of the other techniques. Where were those other techniques? Pick one of them, right? That's too bad, right? We've added this to the ISA to fix a problem, which is pipeline being not full when you have a branch. But we haven't solved the problem because there are many other ways to fix the problem, and we reverted back to that. Basically, the issue is now ISA is tied to the implementation, right? The implementation, if the implementation has, it requires five cycles to resolve the branch, you need actually five delay slots after the branch. If the implementation requires 100, you need 100. But you don't want to tie, uh, tie the ISA to the implementation. You want this interface uh, to change without the, uh, to, to stay the same without the implementation. So that's, the, that's, the major, that's one of the major problems with the delay slot. And MIPS, for example, MIPS, uh, when it started out, maybe it had a two-stage pipeline. But later on, the MIPS R10000 architecture uh, had a much longer pipeline, like 12 stages. And how do you actually handle the delay slot? Well, it was a designer's nightmare, almost. <laughs> the designer needed to handle the delay slot, but the designer needed to handle branches in some other way also. Okay. But there are other interesting things you can do with the delay slot also. You can have fancy delayed branches. This is one of my favorites. Uh, the idea is to have delayed branch with squashing. In Spark, for example, if the branch falls through, if the branch is actually not taken, the delay slot instruction is not executed. So again, we're redefining the semantics of the branch instruction. If the branch is taken, the next sequential instruction after the branch is always executed. If the branch is not taken, that instruction is not executed. It's squashed. It's called delayed branch with squashing. And can you guess why this could help? It's actually a good idea once you buy into the idea of delay slots. Yes? Well, you always know, you always know there, there's, there's one of two possible next instructions you have, and you always know what they are because they're the next two. OK. What, when, is, when, when do you know that? When do, what, what is a good example from a construct? When you take, if, if you're going to take the branch, uh -huh. the next instruction is, is the next one. Uh -huh. if, you're not going to take the branch, the, the, the next instruction is the one after that. So if you have two like fetchers, it's, it's pretty like you'll you'll always know the address of the next instruction. Well, okay. The but possible addresses of the next instruction. So if you have like two fetchers, uh -huh. you can fetch you you can always know both, both addresses. Okay, you, yeah, you need that condition. But what kind of a construct is this optimized for? Yes. So this allows the compiler to bring the branch target to the instruction after the branch. That's right. Yes. Since it will be squashed, I guess if it's not taken. That's right. If it's not taken, it's going to be squashed. So this allows the compiler to bring the branch target right after the branch to be the next sequential instruction. Or something around the branch target, right? It doesn't have to be the target instruction necessarily. And what is this good? There is one construct that's very common in programs. It's called a loop, right? If you have a backward branch, let's take a look at this. Uh, you have this code, x is the beginning of the loop, a, b, c, all dependent instructions. Too bad. <laughs> and you have a branch conditional x, it's a backward branch. Well, you, if you have a normal, uh, if you have delayed branch, you cannot fill this delayed trunk if you don't have squashing. Why? You cannot move a, b, c into the delayed slot, right? And you cannot move d, e because you don't know whether the branch is taken or not taken. There's no instruction here that's executed regardless of the way the branch, is, uh, the branch direction is. But if you have delayed branch with squashing, you could do this. You could basically reorganize the code a little bit. And you could do this, right? Basically, you could put A, branch target in this case, into the delay slot. And if the branch is, uh, this is the first iteration. You execute A. Uh, and BC, when the branch is taken, you're going to execute the next iteration anyway, so you execute A. When the branch is not taken, this gets squashed, so you fall through the loop. Make sense? So this enables you to handle the loops nicely and fill the delay slot. 
Probably a good idea if you have delay slots. And you can, you can look at the Spark ISA manual for other uh, ways of handling uh, other, other kinds of delay slots. It's actually interesting. OK, what are the advantages of this? I think we're going to go through this quickly. It keeps the pipeline full with useless ins uh, useful instructions in a simple way. Right? It's actually simple. Again, it's compiler based, similar to other MIPS philosophy. Right? The compiler does the interlocking for the control dependencies. You can think of it that way. It fills uh, the control flow bubbles with useful instructions. This is possible assuming that the number of delay slots is equal to the number of instructions to keep the pipeline full before the branch resolves. If you would like to only employ delay branching, that's what you need. And all delay slots can be filled with useful instructions. Right? And these two are difficult. Well, first of all, it's not easy to fill the delay slots, even with a two-stage pipeline. That's where the branch delayed with squashing helps. That's why people actually added those instructions to fill the delay slots. And also, well, first of all, number of delay slots increases with pipeline depth or execution width, right? Let's say you have a 20-stage pipeline where the branch resolves after 20, 20 cycles and a three-wide machine. That's 60 instructions. 60 delay slots? Probably not. Number of delay slots should be variable with variable latency operations. This may not be immediately clear, but if, you, if a branch is actually depend on a load instruction, and if you're doing something like out of order execution, it takes variable number of cycles to resolve the branch. Right. And you've, you need to keep fetching in more instructions into the pipeline to keep your pipeline full. So once you have variable latency, resolution of branch, and you have enough buffering uh, in your uh, in your microarchitecture to buffer later incoming instructions, this becomes hard to do. Okay. And we've already talked about this, right? Ties ISA semantics to hardware implementation. Spark, MIPS, and HPPA all had one delay slots, and because the pipeline implementation changed in the next design, they needed much longer pipelines. The designers still needed to deal with the delay slots. Okay. OK, I guess one aside, how do you fill the delay slot? This is uh, from, from your book. But if you look at this, you have this branch, and you have this delay slot. If this instruction is independent, you can fill it with this instruction from a same basic block. But even for conditional branches, you can fill the delay slot with instructions from some other path. right? For example, uh, you have this uh, branch again. Uh, you cannot fill it with this instruction, but you can fill it from uh, an instruction from the target, right? The subtract instruction is not dependent. So you can put the target instruction to the delay slot, even if you don't have squashing. So we've filled the delay slot this way. The target instruction at the target of the branch is filled. Now the problem is this is always executed regardless of the branch is taken or not taken. If the branch is taken, it's fine, because we've filled the instruction from the target. But what if the branch is not taken? We've done some operation that we shouldn't have done. So what do you do? The compiler inserts another instruction to the not taken path that undoes that effect. Does that make sense? So this is called fix up code in compiler terminology that undoes the effect of uh, other instructions that are inserted due to scheduling, for example, uh, to, to enable this. So basically, it's fix-up code. You've done something that uh, you, you've executed an instruction to fill the delay slot, uh, assuming that the branch will be taken for, from the target path. In the not taken path, well, you need to undo the subtract operation. The good thing is subtract operation is probably undoable, right? <laughs> you do an add to compensate that effect. So you, ha you have an additional instruction in the other path. Similarly here also, if you fill the instruction with this subtract instruction that happens to be in the fall through path, uh, then, uh, if you, uh, then this instruction is always executed regardless of whether or not the branch is falling through. So if the branch is actually taken, you need to do an operation 
again, fix up code, the compiler needs to insert an operation that ensures that the program still executes correctly. So you could do this kind of optimizations to uh, make uh, delay, to fill the delay slots, but it does now complicate the other path, right? Now you're executing more instructions. Okay. And I guess the, the other question is, are these safe operations? Maybe moving subtract up is safe, but what if you move an instruction that caused an exception, right? You don't want this to be visible to the programmer. You don't. OK, let's, go, let's look at do something else in, in a little bit more detail. This is another way of handling control flow dependencies, right? Finally, multi-threading. And I've given you the basic idea, so I'll go through this quickly also. Hardware has multiple thread contexts, and each cycle, fetch engine fetches from a different thread. By the time the fetched branch or instruction resolves, there's no need to fetch another instruction from the same thread. You can think about it in another way. The branch or instruction resolution latency is overlapped with the execution of other threads instructions. So if you look at this, uh, you're fetching from multiple different streams. And these are different pipeline stages. When stream three, uh, thread three's instruction is being fetched, stream two, thread two is fetching its operands, stream one is in its execution phase, stream eight is also its in the execution phase, Stream four, another, uh, another thread is storing its result. So there's no, uh, there are no two stages in the pipeline that are executing instructions from the same thread. Which means that there's no logic needed for handling control and data dependencies within a thread. It's beautiful. The downside is single thread performance suffers, right? If you have only one thread, stream one, let's say, you cannot fetch from that until the previous instruction for that thread is retired. It's gone out of the pipeline. So this works if you have lots of threads, lots of streams. Another downside is now you, you need extra logic to, for different thread contexts, right? You're switching between different threads every cycle, which means that you need to have register files and program counters for all threads. And we've already talked about this. Basically, if you do not have enough threads, well, your throughput suffers. OK, I think we. So this is a general mechanism to handle any kind of dependency, right? You tolerate the control and data dependency latencies by overlapping the latency with useful work from some other thread. So it's a general mechanism. Another way of looking at it is you're, now you're improving pipeline utilization by taking advantage of multiple threads. So if you have multiple threads, and if you don't care about single thread performance, it's actually a great way of improving performance, right? Improving throughput. You keep a very simple pipeline. No data and control dependency checking. So there are some applications you may think of where uh, this fine-grained multi-threading is very useful. And in fact, it's employed in graphics processing units today. You basically fine-grain multi-thread between many different threads. And the pipeline is simple. There's no need for control or data dependency checking in a graphics processor. Because all of those threads that are operating on different parts of an image, let's say, are independent. Make sense? This is actually a very, very old concept. Uh, this is, uh, remember the Control Data Corporation that we discussed earlier, which was a competitor to IBM? They did out of order execution. Well, they actually came up with fine grained multi threading also in the 1960s. Uh, I'll cover this in a little bit. But Burton Smith's pipeline uh, HEP processor, the heterogeneous element processor, is the one that actually made it. Uh, uh, popularized it. And this is actually, this idea is later employed in Terra, uh, multi-threaded architecture, which was designed by Cray later on, bought by Cray. Uh, and you can imagine those computations being very highly parallel also, scientific computations on very large-scale large arrays, right? You can parallelize them and uh, have multiple threads operating on them. Okay, so why did they do this? A little bit of history. Uh, the Control Data Corporation 6600s has a peripheral, a peripheral processing unit, which is an I.O. unit, which is a memory unit today. At that time, memory was the I.O. Uh, and uh, the idea was that it took 10 cycles to access the memory unit. So they didn't want these 10 cycles to be wasted. You, didn't want, uh, you want to tolerate that 10 cycle latency. 
So they added a 10 cycle pipeline uh, and a processor executed a different I.O. thread every cycle. So basically they multiplexed this pipeline across 10 different threads to tolerate the 10 cycle latency. An operation from the same thread is executed every 10 cycles. That's the idea. Uh, the heterogeneous element processor, and this is a nice small paper that you may want to read, it had 120 threads per processor. 120 register files, 120 program counters. So it's actually big, right? And it had some threads could be available, some threads could be unavailable, and thread could be in two states. And each thread had only one instruction in the processor pipeline, and each thread was independent. Basically, to each thread, the processor looks like a non-pipeline machine, right? Because it's fine-grained multi-threaded. For each thread, it doesn't look like there's a pipeline. So the trade-off is, of course, system throughput versus single thread performance. So basically, their cycle time, this is one uh, high-level view of the processor, heterogeneous element processor. There were eight stages in the pipeline. And it took 800 nanoseconds to complete a single instruction, assuming no memory access. So there are eight stages, but they have 120 threads. Something doesn't add up, right? Why would you want to have 120 threads? if you have only eight stages. Isn't eight enough? Say it again. If you miss. If you miss. Miss meaning memory latency, right? Yes. So remember, this is uh, the, the fine-grained multi-threading idea is general to tolerate memory latency. If some threads are accessing memory, this is the instruction fetch. You fetch the operands. And if a thread is accessing memory, it took a long time to access memory. That thread went to the waiting queue. And if you have enough threads, many threads could be accessing memory, but some of them are always making progress, hopefully. Right? So it can tolerate memory latency this way. When one thread is waiting for memory, you fetch from another thread. And if you have 120 threads, hopefully you can keep your eight stage pipeline full with an instruction uh, from eight threads that are not waiting for memory. That's the hope. So that's the idea of latency tolerance. You're tolerating either control dependence latency, data dependence latency, or memory latency by executing instructions from different threads in different stages of the pipeline. OK, so this is one high level example of a multi-thread pipeline. This comes at a cost, of course. It's not cheap, right? Basically, you need to have multiple program counters. You need to have some logic that selects between them. And you need to have multiple register files for different threads. These are independent threads. Right? And if you have 120 of them, you'd better have 120 register files. Right? And you need to have some sophisticated thread select logic. In this case, it's not sophisticated. It's always round robin across threads. But that will not work uh, in this case. Right? Here, actually, you had thread IDs stored in the queues. And these queues had the th thread IDs, or the next program counter of the thread. Uh, that goes to uh, fetch. So a thread could be in these, this queue, memory waiting queue, or waiting to be fetched queue, or executing. So you can think of these as threads that are traveling in the processor. OK. OK, this actually exists in real uh, recent processors also, Sun Niagara. Well, I already told you that it exists in GPUs, but it exists in a different way, which we, we will hopefully talk about. This is the uh, Sun Niagara pipeline. This is one of the first multi-core machines. Uh, of its time. Uh, and uh, the idea is uh, basically you have, again, four threads uh, in, a, in a processor, in a pipeline. This is the fetch engine. You have the iCache. And there's some logic that picks what is the next thread we're going to fetch from. And uh, which thread to fetch from, normally it's round robin across the four threads. But if a thread actually has missed, this logic doesn't select that thread. So you have a bubble in that case. And there may be other reasons uh, to select some other thread. And you need to uh, fetch the instructions. And there is another thread select mux here, because there is some buffering in the instructions, instruction uh, buffer. And then there is a decode stage. And then there are four register files, if you look at this, because you need to support four threads. And the rest is the same. So you have additional logic, which could increase your critical path also. OK. What are the advantages of this? Well, no need for dependency checking between instructions now, right? 
There's only one instruction in the pipeline from a single thread. No need for branch prediction logic. And otherwise, bubble cycles are used for executing useful instructions from different threads. And hopefully, you're improving system throughput, latency tolerance, and utilization. These concepts are actually relatively tied to each other. Right? You're tolerating latency by executing instructions from a different thread. But that also improves system throughput. Disadvantage I, already, uh, disadvantage I already told you most of these. Extra hardware complexity. Reduce single thread performance, because you're fetching one instruction from a thread every n cycles now, instead of every cycle. And there's one, th one more thing we're going to get to later on. Because you have more threads, you have more contention and shared resources. And what are those shared resources? Memory, for example, right? Caches. A thread doesn't have the cache to itself now. It's sharing that cache with many threads. And it, um, OK, we'll get to that. It's sharing the memory bandwidth with many threads also. And some dependency ch checking logic between threads remains. If you cannot guarantee that threads are not independent of each other in terms of memory, this will remain. OK, what's next? Now you know fi fine grained multi threading. Any questions about this? Good. So let's take a, a deeper look at branch prediction now. I'm going to go through this quickly, but basically, you know the idea. Instead of stalling, we're going to fill the instructions, uh, predict the target address of the branch. And you can animate these nicely. And that's the motivation. You can basically significantly improve performance. Uh, downside, misprediction penalty. When you mispredict, somehow you need to flush the pipeline. Right. And basically, that flush is important. Because if you actually do this, this is a modern pipeline with lots of stages. At some point, you verify the prediction. If there is a misprediction, you need to flush a lot of instructions. Why am I harping on this? Because this is another way of actually improving performance. You would like to minimize the effect of this flush on the performance. OK. So I think I'll uh, look at this. This is, this is the pipeline you're going to implement, so I'm not going to talk about this. But there is a two-cycle branch misprediction penalty. So if you look at this, a branch is actually resolved at the ALU stage. right? This is your branch. It's resolved in the ALU stage. And let's assume that you always predict PC plus 4. And uh, actually, you should have predicted the target address of the branch. So you're wrong. When the ALU provides the branch condition, remember you're checking the branch condition at, at the end of the ALU, branch equal. Now you can redirect the fetch stage. You figure out that you predicted incorrectly. There is some extra logic that checks that. And once you predict incorrectly, you need to flush the remaining instructions in the pipeline. And that's what a flush looks like, basically. You're, you're getting rid of some instructions in your pipeline. And you're redirecting fetch to the target address instead of the PC plus 4 and PC plus 8 that you've fetched. So which means that you've lost two cycles, right? That's your branch misprediction penalty in the pipeline you're implementing. Two cycles. Now let's take a look at that. Correct yes, there is no penalty. And remember the 86% of the time with, the, with all those assumptions that we made. So 86% of the time, we're correct. Incorrect guess, you get two bubble cycles. If you assume this, uh, what is your CPI in this case? Right. Your CPI is, well, I guess actually you don't, uh, we've already assumed that. So your CPI is what it, whatever I calculated here. How convenient, I guess it's here. You have one, C, one cycle per instruction. And because we're mispredicting 14% uh, of the time, we're adding two cycles 14% of the time to one cycle per instruction. So our CPI is 1.28. So there are two things that you can do. This is the probability of a wrong guess. You can reduce this. And this is a penalty for a wrong guess, two cycles. You can also reduce this. Right? Can you? I guess let's take a look. So how can you reduce this? By re yeah. Oh, that's right, yeah. But we're not employing branch delay slot right now. Let's, let's ignore that. No more branch delay slots. Let's talk about branch prediction. So we can reduce the penalty for a wrong guess by resolving the branch early, if we can do that. Right? And if you look at your pipeline, you can do that. The branches depend on the register. Once you have that register, you can do the comparison, right? And you, you have the target address 
also it's because it's dependent on PC plus some offset, which comes from the instruction. So you basically add this comparator at, after the end of the register file. And now your misprediction penalty is only one cycle, right? Because you fetch the branch, you decode it. At the same time you decode it, you compute its condition, and you determine the next fetch address. So you know the next fetch address by the end of the decode cycle of the branch instead of by the end of the ALU cycle of the branch. And this way, in the next cycle, you can fetch the correct instruction if the branch is taken. This way, you can reduce your cycles per instruction right, without changing your prediction accuracy. So this is uh, basically 0.14% 14, uh, 14 of the time. You have one cycle bubble instead of two cycle bubbles, two cycles of bubble. So it's 1.14 CPI instead of 1.28. That looks nice, right? Is this a good idea? You lengthen your trees of time. That's right, exactly. I don't know if it's a good idea, but remember the performance equation? It doesn't, it's the number of instructions times cycles per instruction times cycle time. It depends. Did your cycle time increase here? We've definitely reduced the cycle for instruction. We're not touching the number of instructions. But what did we do with the cycle time? You might have increased your cycle time now, right? Because you're actually adding an ALU here, a subtractor or a comparator. So it may not be a good idea in this case. But it depends, actually, where, where your critical path is. OK. OK, branch prediction, let's look at it some enhanced methods of branch prediction. Uh, basically, we're, we're trying to predict the next fetch address right, to be used in the next cycle, which means that we really need to predict three things. Whether the fetch instruction is a branch, the direction of the branch if it's conditional, and the target address of the branch if it's taken. So let's, let's, let's pick each of these one by one. Target address, how do we predict that? Because we need the target address right away. Whereas we have not fetched the instruction yet. Right. This is the instruction fetch stage. Even if the target address comes from the instruction bits, we haven't fetched the instruction yet. But we need the target address for the next cycle. So the observation is that target address remains the same for a conditional direct branch across dynamic instances. If your branch is PC plus offset, if the target address is PC plus some offset, it remains the same, right? So the first time you execute the branch, or first time you take that branch, you take that target address, store it in some location, in, uh, in some hardware structure. And the next time you fetch the branch, you access that structure with the program counter of the branch and get the target address. Make sense? So this is memorizing what was your target address in the previous executions. Store the target address from previous instance and access it with the PC. This is also called a branch target buffer or branch target address cache. I think IBM likes calling it branch target address cache. Basically, the first time you execute the branch, branch is done, you know the target address. You index some structure with the program counter of the branch and insert the target address. Next time you fetch the branch, you have the program counter, you index the structure. Oh, target address is there. And while you're doing this, you can now access the instruction memory, or iCache, instruction cache with the same PC. Now you can get the target address in parallel with the instruction memory access while you're accessing the instruction. So let's, take, let's try to put these a little bit together. Basically, what we're trying to do is, while we're fetching the instruction, we want to get the target address. We also want to figure out what the direction is. Now, cache of target addresses, let's concern ourselves with this one. You take the program counter address of the current branch or current instruction, because you don't know if it's a branch. right? You just have a program counter at that point. You access the structure. The structure gives you a hit, or a, a hit signal and a target address. And you also, using the program, program counter, this is one way of doing the prediction, you have a direction prediction, saying, is it taken or is it not taken? It doesn't have to use the program counter, but I'm giving you an example 
This is a flash forward. We'll see how this is designed. And the direction prediction somehow says taken or not taken. This doesn't have to be through a structure, right? You could always say always taken. And if this branch target buffer gives a hit, and if the branch is predicted to be taken by the direction predictor, and we'll see many examples of this, then you pick the target address coming out of this branch target buffer as the next fetch address. Otherwise, you predict the next fetch address is the next sequential instruction. Make sense? So now we can predict the target address. In the, also, in parallel with this, I don't show it here, there's an instruction cache that's being accessed with the address of the current branch. Right? Uh, address of the current instruction. This should be, you don't know it's the branch, right? It's the current instruction. So once you have the instruction, you also have the next fetch address. Make sense? It's simple. Uh, of course, you need additional structures. So now, uh, let's say we are doing always taken. Let's eliminate this thing. Let's say, regardless of the program counter, we're going to predict taken. If you're doing always taken, remember that 20% instructions, 20% of the instructions were branches, and 70% of, of those were taken. Now your misprediction, additional cycles per instruction is 20% of the time uh, you mispredict. 30% of the time, 20, uh, yeah, basically you get the wrong direction, uh, you get the wrong prediction 6% of the instructions. So you have a bubble of two cycles for 6% of the instructions. So you get a 1.12 CPI, cycles per instruction. Now you can enable always taken prediction with this branch target buffer. Right? So how do you know whether the instruction is a branch or not? Uh, I didn't talk about this here, but if, a, if an instruction actually hits in the branch target buffer, you can assume that it's a branch, right? Basically, for other instructions, that aren't, uh, you're not going to insert anything into the branch target buffer. Make sense? So that's how you know whether an instruction is a branch. You could use another bit. You could have it in the, uh, somewhere in, in here, but that's the idea. So this implicitly tells you whether the instruction is a branch or not. And if you never executed that instruction, well, you don't have the target address anyway. So you'd better predict not taken anyway, right? You don't care if it's a branch or not if you never execute that instruction with this structure. OK? So this is the way we, uh, you can do branch prediction. You can do more sophisticated direction prediction that we will see soon. You can actually do, have other logic here that gives you direction prediction to be better. OK. Let me give you some schemes uh, before we part. But in the next lecture, we're going to cover lots of direction prediction schemes. And we've already covered some of them. Some of them are compile time. Always not taken is actually static, right? It's statically you determine uh, uh, that branch will be predicted always not taken. It could be always taken. It could be backward taken, forward not taken. It could be profile based. And we're going to look at some dynamic schemes, dynamically based on which direction the pre, uh, branch went the previous times, we're going to predict the direction of the branch the current time it's executed. Actually, we're going to go even more sophisticated, perhaps. Uh, we're going to try to figure out the likely direction based on the program analysis. Basically, you look at the branch. Uh, maybe the branch is actually guarding an error code. Right? Well, you can say that most of the time, the program will not give an error. So you can predict that branch such that it doesn't go into the error code. Right? And the compiler can figure this out. Or the programmer can figure this out and convey it to the hardware. So I think let's uh, stop here. This is a good uh, place to break. We're going to continue with uh, branch prediction in the next lecture. <laughs>